Hi, I'm Richard, and today I want to talk to you about data intensive research in the cloud. Now, it's an incredibly popular form of research, especially recently, but it's quite a hard one to do. Uh, you need to juggle a lot of balls, especially when you're working in larger teams or with larger data sets. Uh, whether it's understanding how to find ways to remotely compute or hold your data, whether you've got uh, distributed sort of sensor networks away from standard infrastructure for IoT, whether you've got data that's too big to be held within a standard relational database, or understanding how to build your code and how to manage your data, or even how to hold, um, handle and deal with sensitive data when you do come across it. Now, within half an hour, I can't promise to deliver a masterclass on any of these. This is only intended as a way to familiarize and orient yourself with, um, with each of the topics. And I'm sure many of you will have come across or know quite a bit, well, some cloud computing or, well, of course, this is how you look after your code. And if so, I'm sorry for teaching you to suck eggs, but I'm sure there'll be something new to everyone. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover in half an hour. So um, just quickly, this talk was first put together um, as part of the FDL program for last year. It's an amazing sort of applied AI sort of 12 week hackathon with some of the best AI scientists, AI engineers, data scientists in the world. Uh, I believe they're actually talking in the slot after mine. So please check out the website and check out their talk. And I'm Richard. Uh, I've, I'm currently the CTO for a um, ag, sort of ag tech startup working with a lot of farms out in Columbia. I'm also director for a small consultancy and I'm doing that while also uh, finishing up a doctorate at Oxford for applied AI for working out when volcanoes blow up. Anyway, this is the most important diagram of my entire presentation and I will come back to this. You have to work up through this. AI is a fantastic, amazing sort of uh, technique and opportunity to achieve fantastic things, but it's not possible unless it's held up by a lot of, um, you know, yes, I can understand some of the simpler algorithms and experimentation over some of the feature extraction, the analytics behind that, selecting your training data, spotting anomalies, preparing, cleaning your data, making sure your data flows are reliable, even making sure that your instrumentation is correct. You have to start at the bottom and work your way up. Either you, part of your team, if you work with inside a research team or a large organization, every single one of these has to be met or you're likely to have real issues in one, building a model, two, deploying a model, three, proving that it works and is reliable. Now, we've got a lot to cover. So cloud, it's not really this all nebulous, all seeing, all knowing, ephemeral presence online. It's quite simple. Some people have decided to share their servers with us. So we're using machines that aren't sat next to you and you can store data on them or you can run programs on them. That's all it is, you just rent them. Or sometimes the services that they've built to provide to you. Um, the only difference is that they've got so many servers that they can play some games with how much it costs at what time and what resources are available. And that's where cloud really comes in. So there's a lot of providers, the big ones, Amazon, Google, and Azure dominate most of the market. IBM's kicking around as well as a fourth, but only just. Um, and it's a huge, huge market. AWS is the largest, but um, Azure and GCP, I would also recommend as absolutely fine for any kind of machine learning or data-driven research you want to do. Now there's hundreds of services, but they all boil down to two simple ones, especially if you're just starting which is cloud storage. So I want somewhere to store my data and some sort of compute engine, which is I've got my data. Now I want to run a program on my data. Now you don't normally just store it on a VM and just hold your data there. You often have it stored in uh, specialized areas, things like bucket storage or block-based storage in Google, which is what we're going to be using for a lot of these examples for Google Cloud Platform or GCP. It is just called cloud storage. Azure call them sort of storage accounts or data lake gen one, and there's a gen two that's just been released as well. Um, and in AWS, the common one is S3 storage. Uh, for cloud compute, again, that's often cloud compute engine is where you find VMs for Google. If you're on Azure, look for virtual machines or EC2 for AWS. Now, bucket storage. Um, 
very, very, very cheap, but it can get cheaper. So if you're holding a couple of gigabytes, just stick it in standard storage. If you've got petabytes, you need to be careful because even at sort of two cents per gigabyte per month, that costs a lot. The prices do go down if you've got petabytes of storage, just usually you work out deals, but still um, you work out how much data do I need to access now that often sits in standard storage. And then data you think you have to hold, but you'll probably never need to access. You just hold it as a insurance almost, oh, you know, you need to hold this for legal reasons or archive reasons, the further down you'll put it where it costs a lot more to access, but a lot less to store. And this structure will be the same for Azure and the same for AWS. For compute, um, it's quite simple. You just set up a VM and it's a virtual server that you specify the number of cores you want, the number of GPUs you want, the amount of memory, do you want an IPU, a TPU, any kind of flavor. They're often with predefined builds. So if you want a, a particular operating system or container, those are often loaded in for you straight away. And then you can pay for it in three different ways and they're replicable. So if you decide you like your setup and you want it spread out along um, to 100 other machines, you just replicate and it'll be with you within a few minutes. Now, if you're getting into this, you'll be given a lot of options. The ones to watch out for are E2 and N1. E2 are really low cost. If you're doing a little data processing microservice, very easy to do. N1s are balanced ones. Um, there's a few that will meet this need. N1 are the old generation and cost a little bit less. If you go into the others, do some research, it's sort of beyond the scope of this talk. Um, they can be fantastic, especially things like memory optimized ones for when you've got memory sort of bottlenecked uh, algorithms, but you start going from maybe costing up to $300 a month up to, you know, 64,000. Now pricing uh, for compute can split in three different ways. It can be on demand, which is how most people use it. You go, I want this server, I want it now, and I'll pay for it by hour or by minute. You run it only when you want, you can stop it and it won't be disappeared. It will just stop running. It'll be held in memory somewhere um, and you will only pay while it's running. You can do preemptive instead, otherwise known as spot pricing, where if you need to do lots of background data prep, which is not time sensitive, you can go, oh, I'll only pay, you know, $2 an hour rather than six uh, for a large machine. And when the machines are in less demand overnight um, and the sort of the price drops, uh, if it if the price crosses your bid point, your machine will start to charge, uh, will spin up and start running while uh, it's below that price point. If it peaks above it, uh, then your machine will shut down until the next time. And lastly, committed use, quite rare, uh, especially in research, but if you know you're gonna be using uh, compute constantly, nonstop for a year or three years, it can be quite cheap as well. Um, there's a lot more than just these um, in terms of the software that's available for this sort of data technology stack. And actually even just within Google's offerings, those two areas just point to cloud uh, compute engine and cloud storage. There's a lot more that you can explore if you want to get into it. Of those ones to have a look at this cloud code, which is an IDE that sits within GCP um, that just runs quite nicely with Kubernetes. It gives you a nice consistent IDE, fantastic for larger teams when you want consistency. There's the cloud SDK that can be installed onto your own machine that allows you to interact um, with sort of your platform through the command line locally. The AI Hub and AI platform where you can find a lot of the auto ML offerings for Google as well as some advanced sort of notebook solutions. Cloud functions are great for data prep. You just give them a Python bit of code or a bit of C sharp or a bit of Go and it will take it, work out all the server hosting itself and only charge you for the seconds that it runs. Cloud SQL is a fantastic way for getting a relational database with none of the management headache and Cloud CLI sits inside the platform a bit like Cloud SDK and allows you to manage your resources from the command line. Now big data, also big scary bit like cloud but it's not again all nebulous it's quite simple so the analogy of i want to build a big lego house well i can be very very good at building lego but there's only so fast i can put blocks on top of one another so if i want to go faster i need to ask my friends and that's fine with one or two but when i start to get eight or ten people i can't really fit them around my table and I might be trying to build a foundation and they'll build a wall on top of me. Maybe they'll knock over something. It starts to get a bit hectic. No one knows which order to go in or how to do it. Now, this is quite 
similar to what happens with traditional approaches with sort of relational databases and working with data. They, you know, long came these sort of solutions, things like Hadoop or Scoop or Cassandra or Presto, where so the relational databases went, okay, we'll just be, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger with more cores and uh, more memory and faster clock speeds. They couldn't keep up with the amount of data and what needs to be done. And when they tried to distribute out to have lots and lots of different machines working on it, they couldn't manage it. This is where big data comes in. Things like Hadoop, which is quite early, did this quite well. Um, newer sort of solutions go towards Teradata or Spark, especially Spark for being a lot cheaper, um, or rather it's open source where Teradata very much isn't. Now, it's not just those, there's a huge landscape again, but those are the ones you probably would have heard of and are worth starting with. So what really defines big data? It's quite hard to do, but often they talk about the three Vs. Uh, often these are expanded, you can have up, I've seen up to 11, five is a good middle ground. The idea is that you need a combination of a couple of different challenges, two or three of the Vs. So maybe it's the fact that you have such a large data set. Well, that's okay because a database can still manage that, until you say, yes, but I need it to be processed within an hour and I need to double check the veracity. So I need to make sure that all that it passes my verifications. Oh, and the variety. So I've got a lot of multimedia there. I've got, um, you know, multi-dimensional tenses and audio and images of people's signatures in terms of variability as well, in terms of how much data comes through, when, how often that data changes in schema as well. When you start to have two or three of them combined, suddenly your traditional approaches really start to break down. You can't scale up anymore to meet this, but your technology can't, isn't used to scaling out. And again, this is where this idea of sort of Hadoop and MapReduce come in. It's less scary than it seems. All that happens is firstly, your data can't be in one place because everyone fights over it too much, all your resources do. So you distribute it. You get clusters of it and sort of fragments of it spread across a cluster of little um, uh, sort of almost like virtual machines. We call them nodes and node clusters. And it's incomplete copies of data, but it, but it uh, records kept of where that data is and it's duplicated. Then um, when you have a query that gets sent out and all these queries get sent out to nodes and they will work out, this is the data I hold, this is the data I need, this is the operation I need, and they're scheduled to do that computation, it's all done in parallel. And then eventually all these results are sent out and reduced back down. That one's a little bit scary. Usually, okay, and most of the problems have always been ironed out, but there's only little things that differ. So where a SQL database, um, a, a standard relational one, you might uh, give a query and limit it to the first 10 results that come back, they will always be the same. In a distributed system and a big data system, they'll always be different because the order of arrival dictates it. So ordering is a bit funny when you work with big data, but usually if you go into this level of implementation, there's a specialist on hand. So this is less of your headache. Just watch out that you can't assume that big data systems will give you an ordered result where you would from a standard uh, database. Again, so you have a management software that receives a query. This is your sort of Spark, Impala, Athena, Hive. This is a one to your front end and it dives down. It receives a query, it works out what it looks like. It tells the scheduler. The scheduler is a piece of, is a small tool that can talk to all of the nodes and tell them what to do, when, in what order and what data to access. The nodes, which are often a container, run away, process the request and send back the results. Um, the nodes don't always hold data themselves. It may be in some sort of um, heap structure or, um, yeah. Eventually the nodes finish processing. They start sending the results back. They're all amalgamated back and eventually the results are then presented as part of the, the original software's um, window. So these schedulers are often the hardest thing to do and that's why you see so many variants on it. Um, but it always, always boils back to the sort of the traditional map and reduce. Where you map resources and data out and reduce it back down. And that's about as complicated as it gets. Now IoT, well, again, not complicated, not too nebulous. Um, 
it's as simple as I want to record something and I want it to be sent back to me. So if there's a device that has some sensor and a way to transmit that through a network, that's all it needs to be. Now there are points to consider when you design any kind of research based on this, how are you going to collect it? Is there any preparation that can be done before it gets transmitted? Or rather, what preparation you need to do once it's arrived? Does it need to be encoded before transmission so that it requires less bandwidth? Can you do edge processing to simplify your sort of work downstream or to reduce transmission? How do you handle the outputs if they're asynchronous and also with the storage? These often tend to be event streams, which are much harder to store than a standard data table. But there's no avoiding them. They're absolutely everywhere. Even the Mars rover, you could argue, is an IoT device. It has a series of sensors and, you know, when everything aligns, it can transmit it. Now, the network's a bit further than your usual network, but it still stands. Even something as simple as this. Now, transmission is one thing to consider. So are you going to be able to collect data if it fails to flush? So where there is no signal, sometimes data will never get pushed through. And if you do rely on transmission, is it going to be in batch where they're nice tables or is it going to be a stream of information? And if so, what happens if it doesn't arrive in time and it's asynchronous? And likewise, we receive data how can you interact and send data? Is it that you have location data? So things like um, our GPS, GLONASS and Galileo data that you can hold as well, um, or RTK data, which is a real-time kinematic. So quite common within agriculture to um, correct GPS signals down to two centimeter resolution. So just beyond um, the sensor data itself, there's additional metadata you can attach to it. Likewise, you can find ways to interact with any kind of IT through either um, engineers going out, plugging in laptops by USB data cable, less ideal, or even things like voice commands. And lastly, what sort of data transmission are you considering? Is it going to be Wi-Fi to a base station that's nearby, or are you relying on GSM transmission over a SIM card? Now, I've given you a rundown of sort of the three areas, but what really matters is how you work with them. So there are three main patterns that are important backing up your data and your code and everything you've worked with. I know it's obvious, but still finding ways to be elastic. That makes the difference between spending more than you should on cloud and a lot less than you thought you would. And lastly, making sure that all the work that you do is clean and explicit. Otherwise, you lose a lot of the value and effort when your project makes no sense. So there is no iron backup, but there is an iron project failure. It's not enough just to hold a backup of your current data set either. It's a bit more complicated than that. So when you start evolving your data, you often go from data set to data set. And each time you move data, it follows a pattern of three core steps, no matter what you do. You ingest the data from another source, another point in the system. You may manipulate it and may output it to somewhere else. These are often called as well, extract, transform, and load, otherwise known as ETL or its variant ELT. Now it's all very well that you could do it all in one go, but actually it's helpful to do it in little stages. And there are three core sort of stepping off points for data. There's this idea of raw, processed and cooked. Raw data is data as is, it's as it's arrived in your system from a third party, from an external sensor. Now it may not be readable, it may be useless, it needs to be processed, but it doesn't matter, you never touch it. You only ever calculate on it once you have a copy. The important thing is that if anything ever goes wrong, that's, that data is already in your system. You can build it back up from first principles. Then your data moves on to what's called process data. This is data that's readable. You can ingest it into a system. It may have issues with data quality, gaps. You've not calculated anything. You've not done feature extraction, but it's readable and handleable. And finally, there's what's called cooked data, which is ready for analysis. Often it's structured. It's good to go. There's feature extraction on it. It's all being filtered but we don't always want to do them in one fell swoop. And the reason is going from stage one to two is very different to two to three in terms of what you do. There are what's called hard data rules and these sit between the raw and the process data. You are often changing, the purpose of these is to make data readable. 
not perfect, not complete, just readable. But that often means you start changing the values of certain cells. You may go through and try and find any bad characters, anything like escape characters in text, or casting data types from uh, implied to exact explicit data types, or casting them to different ones where your system can't accept a standard type. Often numerics change. Another one is uh, if you're collecting phone numbers, they are often kept as numerics when they should be kept as strings. So uh, trailing or leading zeros don't get cut off. Now this is quite destructive, as minor as it seems, and the less of this you do, the better. But you don't, you want to isolate this kind of work from any later uh, data um, sort of pipeline work you do, simply because these destroy and change the data directly in cell. The second step is when you've got that readable data, it sits in a database, but you can't run analysis on it yet because there's all sorts of issues, the wrong granularity, um, you need to calculate more data on it, maybe there's uh, data quality issues you need to filter. This is where these soft data rules come in. They often create data, they never destroy it. Maybe they filter, but you've never got this data loss that you get with your process data. So you can it's often derived data sets and you're going to roll it up to a different granularity or do calculations, feature extractions, filtering for data cleaning or just for your model. Effectively, they stack in this way. You've got raw data that goes through a hard data rule and that's a set of um, data transformations as a code base. There's a second set of your data which goes through a second code, code base of your soft uh, data rules or in this case, sorry, soft business rules and finally your cooked set of data. Now this workflow should be quite modular. So you, you should be able to manage it in a way that you have a master pipeline of what works, but old versions should, like any other code base, sit in Git. And those old data sets shouldn't be deleted, but just sat in an archive storage. So you can roll forward and back as you need. This is quite important, especially once you've got a model that wants to be rolled into production, where you can switch through old versions of data prep to see what worked best. It just makes it a bit safer. You never lose your data, especially those data sets that cost you so much to process in the first place. But if there are three rules to working with the data, it's just to keep it raw, hold an original copy of the data, no matter what happens, what happens to your code, whatever you screw up or um, mistype, you'll always be able to work it back from a raw set of data that's inside your control. Secondly, keep it simple. Each of those steps did one thing. I made it readable, then I made it consumable by a model. And even each script you write should only aim to do one minor task. And finally, keep it copied, right? So even if there are parts that you can't pull out normally into intermediate stages, things like uh, intermediate parts of a model, you can always do mem map dumps or numpy dumps if at the very least, having as many little stages for the data to be frozen and held in intermediate stages means that when things go wrong, you don't have to start from the beginning. You can test and see at what point did it go wrong? The smaller those increments are, the faster you can debug. And yeah, there is no iron backup, there is an iron sanity. Three sets of data stores, raw, processed, cooked, and your soft and hard data rules mean that you can have complete uh, replicability with very little drama. Another just one or two points I want to make before the end. Um, the first one is on elasticity. So if a task, a, a data prep task, takes 40 sort of compute hours to compute, if you had a two CPU sort of instance, that will take you 20 hours. But you can actually take a 40 CPU uh, virtual machine, spin it up, and it would cost the same. Simply because, you know, they're charged by the minute or by the hour. The only caveat is if you leave that to run for another half an hour before you shut it down, then it's going to cost a lot more. But you can improve the speed of your processing a lot without increasing the cost, so long as you're careful, so long as you code in, oh, hey, when this program finishes, shut down the machine. And a few sort of um, hygiene and sanity rules, especially when you're working in a larger research team on the same cloud project. One, close your resources when you're not using them. You can pause them instead of delete them and they won't get charged. Just watch out if you want to pause any SQL servers because they do tend to restart after about five days on Google and about seven days, give or take, on Amazon. Uh, it's hard to turn that off as well. I don't believe you can. What you do then is you just create a snapshot of your server and then shut down and um, completely kill and remove that server. And then you can reinstantiate it from the snapshot when you need to. 
if you're working within a research team, try and tag your resources. So any server, any bucket you create, any other service, you'll be given an option on each of the platforms when you create every resource to add some tags, some metadata. I highly recommend it. You're able to know who created it, why they did, what's running on there, and you'll have some visibility. And without it, you'll have zombie servers that have been running for two weeks. No one knows who they are. They just assume they're the other persons. And you'll start racking up a lot of costs. Not to mention, it's quite common if someone accidentally publishes a, a key or a password, if you end up with bit miners, they'll spin up machines that look legit, that look genuine. And it's only with tagging you'll be able to spot, well, they're not following the pattern. Well, who owns this one? Let's ask them if they really do. And part of that also is own your resources. There should be a single person that owns each of the servers. They'll know what code's on there, what's processing, should it be running, shouldn't it be? Which means if anything goes wrong, they can make a call. If you're looking to add tags, think about things like this. So who created it? And it's usually the same as the person that owns it, unless you're doing it on behalf of another person. Is there sensitive data on there? Um, a silly one, but it's always worth tagging. If you're in a larger project, does your small project have a little name that helps you distinguish it? And also a contact number in case there's an emergency, usually some kind of loss of security. Now, the last point I want to make today is just about working with sensitive data. So if you're not sure, check. What does that mean? Well, there's, there's two levels. There's personal data and sensitive data. This is all going to be based on GDPR, um, which is roughly the, one of the strictest ones out there. So if you comply with this, you're going to be fine wherever you work, roughly. I'm not a lawyer, don't take my word for it, but Generally, personal data is anything that lets you identify an individual and associate data with them. So either it's their name, you know, and their address are big ones, but actually it's not just if you can name them, and identify them exactly, but narrow them down to a few possibilities. And that includes pairing data. So it's not just their location, their IP, external IDs like a passport number or their address, even their age and gender, but I'll get on to gender. So it, for example, if I just held birthplace data, that's not personal data, I can't work out who it is, but if I also in that same table, don't hold their name, but their age, their gender and their current postcode, I can probably whittle it down to one person or two or three, and that counts. Lastly, there's also sensitive data. This is quite specific, so it's genetic data, biometric, any physical health, uh, mental health data of the subject or any of their dependents, data about minors and vulnerable adults. That includes things like voice recordings of them speaking in the back of a recorded phone call could technically cast as, be classed as sensitive. Racial, ethnic, political, religious, spiritual, trade mem um, union membership, and also any sort of sexual life and preference data. And increasingly, even though gender is considered personal to some extent and sometimes general, if uh, a sort of, especially recently given directions in terms of sort of um, changes in gender and, and gender sort of self-identification, it can be considered something sensitive. Effectively, sensitive data is anything that could, if it's being leaked, cause physical, mental harm, shame, or any kind of financial or reputational damage to the person it's about. And even more so, I don't know anyone is, but I'll just say criminal record data is even more tightly controlled and need licenses from a European government to handle any of that. Lastly, just ask, is this data essential? Can I generalize it? Put in age ranges rather than specifics. How long do I need it for? Can you define when you need to retire it? Does it always need to exist in the database? With all the other data, can I separate it? And if you're sharing data, make sure you're not publishing anything personal. Can you filter data or tokenize it before you share it with partners? And if not, can you make sure they have some kind of policy or guideline or ethics for handling the data as well? Now, I'll leave it there. I appreciate it's been a whistle stop for just under 30 minutes, but I'll leave you with this. I know that I haven't covered everything um, in as much detail as I would have hoped, but I hope this talk has been a, an eye opener, at least in some areas. But if I'd leave you with one thing, it's this again. AI is fantastic, deep learning, even simpler M ML is fantastic, but it's nothing if you don't build up from the bottom up. Anyway, thank you for listening.